welcome to Think Tech. Welcome to Think Tech on a Thursday. Uh, I'm not David Day. I don't sound like David Day. I don't look like David Day. I'm not as tall as David Day. I'm, I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm here sitting in for him. He's in Vietnam. He's coming back over the weekend, and he'll be resuming his regular Thursday show next week. But I'm going to try to do what the kinds of things that David Day does on a Thursday. And today I'm asking the question, what does, where does India fit in the U.S. rebalance strategy? used to be called the pivot. Now it's called the rebalance strategy. We should examine why they changed the name. Anyway, uh, my guest is Gauri Kandakar. Yes, thank you. Thank yes. you. I got it right. Yes, you did. So no. say hello to the people, Gauri. Uh, hi. Um, thank you for having me here. It's, it's a very nice opportunity for me and my first ever radio show, so I'm very pleased about it. <laughs> I am pleased, too. I'm so happy you're here. But, you know, I'm unhappy that you're here on the day you're leaving. Uh, Gary uh, has been a fellow at uh, Pacific Forum, CSIS, the Center for Strategic, Strategic Inter International Inter Studies, CSIS, which is a think tank out of Washington. And here in Hawaii, in Bishop Square, we actually have a, a branch of a, of a national, I would call it an international think tank, tank which is CSIS. Okay, and uh, Gary has been for the past, what, few months? Yeah, uh, last couple of months, yes. A, a, a fellow, which is really quite a great thing, not only for for her, but for them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I I'm hope not so. sure who gets the, <laughs> the best part of the deal, but they're both getting a good deal. And to be a Pacific Forum fellow is really a terrific thing, and there are some terrific fellows that we've met, both fellows and girl fellows, if, if you don't mind. <laughs> but I, I'd like to get a, a precis, Gary, on uh, your, your training and experience in international affairs. Uh, that you could talk about where India fits in the U.S. rebalance strategy. Tell us about how you came up in life. Oh, okay, so um, I'm Indian, as you can see, and um, I actually moved to France first to do my first master, and I specialize on uh, European uh, Union politics, so I did my first master there. Then I did a second master on the same, it's the European Union politics and administration, but this is a very prestigious university called the College of Europe. It's just a master degree. Um, Did you study in English or some other language? In French. My first master was completely in French, and the second one was bilingual in French and English. And then, so after my specialization on the European Union, um, I st I've worked in... Um, at the United Nations headquarters uh, in New York, at the European Commission, which is one of the institutions of the European Union, uh, that's in Brussels, and also the European Parliament, which is in Brussels, a communications enterprise in Brussels, an American lobby, um, Burson Marsteller, also in Brussels. Uh, I've worked three years in a social welfare NGO in India, uh, and I've been working for the last um, three years at a think tank called Fride, which is uh, Madrid. So uh, what is that? What is, what is that in English? Fride? Uh, well, it's, it's an acronym. It's a long Spanish acronym. Uh, it means Fundación para los Relacion Internacional y el Dialogo Exterior. And this but means it's a you European speak Spanish too. A bit, a bit. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a European think tank looking at um, uh, European foreign policy, and it's um, headquartered in Madrid but has an office in Brussels. And there I, um, I head their Asia program called Agora Asia Europe. So that's me in a big nutshell. <laughs> is, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> is, that there, is that all there is? <laughs> I'm sure there's more to come. <laughs> okay, well, I want to ask you more to come. So, so you came from Brussels. Yes. And you spent a couple months here in Hawaii. Yes. And now today, this very day, I mean, just hours from now, you're on your way back to Brussels. Yes. Yes. To return to, from to whence you came. Yes, <laughs> and I'm telling you, this uh, show is like a very beautiful farewell gift. Uh, just as the CSI has gave me this beautiful, oh. how do you call it? Yeah, let the record reflect that yes. we have a beautiful lay here lay. and a beautiful yes. Indian <laughs> dress underneath. So the whole thing is really perfect. And yes, thank let's you. let's call it a, a beautiful farewell if yes, we possibly can. Yes, it is. Can. So I'm thank you very much. Happy to be part of that. You know, that makes my day, actually. <laughs> makes mine, too. <laughs> So that's the big news that you're, I mean, it's not happy news, but the big news is you're going back to Brussels. Mm -hmm. And uh, so tell me about what, when you get back to Brussels, what are you going to be doing there again? Well, I will be continuing my work uh, researching the European Union's relations with Asia. And I have a lot on my plate to do right now, a lot mm -hmm. of papers. And then I will also be lecturing at a few universities in Finland uh, on EU India and EU Asia. 
and yes, a couple of events that, uh, that we would organize, and yes, the usual. The usual sounds like a fantastic life. <laughs> You're you. everywhere doing everything. <laughs> Do you like the, you know, the career you've chosen for yourself? You know, surprisingly, I didn't choose it. It just happened. It's everything that just, it really just happened with me. The university in France, it's just because I went to learn French in India, and you, they promoted their French university. I said, why not? And what's funny is that I did not know that the master would be in European Union. I thought it was a European Studies master. And I did not know that it would be in French, which I had done just eight months of French before oh, no. going there. So everything is a shock, but you know, I'm happy. I'm quite happy. It's um, pretty diverse. It, it, um, it allows me to, to write uh, on India, a country that I know quite well, if not very well, I will say, and then uh, on the European Union, which is really my biggest passion in life. Mm. So it allows well, a so lot. So given that, you know, given your expertise in matters of India, in matters of Europe and the European Union, your fantastic stay here as a fellow for Pacific Forum. Um, where does your career take you now? What, what kind of a career is this going to be going forward? I would like to continue for some time doing this. And um, uh, you never know. Like one thing I've learned now is you never know where life takes you. It's like yesterday somebody said, it's like you t telling God about your plans and he just laughs. So. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're just he doesn't say anything, amusing does he? him. Yeah, <laughs> so it's better not to have plans. And I guess, um, uh, well, next would probably be a PhD for me, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But after that, I really don't know. I just take it as it goes. Okay, but it's very likely going to be in uh, foreign policy. Yes, that's for sure. Foreign, foreign for, yeah. diplomatic. Who knows? Uh, I've been specializing on this. So foreign policy, international relations, international organizations, definitely. Yeah. Is it possible that you would go back and uh, become part of the Foreign Service of India? I don't see that happening. Uh, tell I me wouldn't. why. Um, because I analyze it from outside, and I would not want to get into that. I mean, I've had a chance to give the exams. My sister's done that, but I would not. Um, I don't see it for me at the moment. Mm -hmm. If I would, I'd rather get into politics inside mm -hmm. uh, someday. But um, for the moment, no, but not in the Ministry of External Affairs. OK, OK. So I, I asked you uh, the way over here uh, about you know what was top-down news about India. Uh, you know, at least in your world, your way of looking at it, and your answer was, well, it's the, it's the economy, silly. <laughs> so yeah. what's going on in the economy of India? In the economy of India, well, it's been quite of um, uh, an up and down roller coaster, let's say. For example, like this year, uh, industrial growth shrunk by 3% in April of 2012, and agricultural growth fell from radically from its target of 4% to 1.7%, which is dramatic for India, given mm -hmm. that 70% of um, the people employed uh, directly or indirectly in, in the agricultural sector. Uh, consumer price index as well, it um, rose to 10.3%, and then um, you have high inflation, but, uh, and GDP, GDP slowed down for the first time in three years to 5.3%, uh, which was worrying, and that happened uh, as well in, in China. You it worried the entire economy, but I think these were kind of the second shocks, second layer of shocks that um, uh, that came about with the continuing crisis in the European Union and the United States, which have been traditional markets for both China and India. Uh, but GDP growth is picking up. Uh, Goldman Sachs has a very optimistic um, forecast of 6.5% in 2013 and then jumping again to uh, seven, more than 7% 7 in 2014. For 2012, they say it's 5.4, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. But it um, should be, I don't know, total, um, e the economy would grow, especially because India has been uh, slowly, since 2009, it got this market focus scheme in place, which means that the market focus scheme is um, India looking at non-traditional markets, so in Latin America, Africa, Asia, to, um, uh, to kind of um, fill the gap in its uh, fallen exports. So they're trying to explore these new markets for new businesses. Uh, and India would reach its uh, target of 500 um, billion 
uh, and exports. exports. Yeah, I think so. With the in, by 2015, though, <laughs> but okay. um, yeah. trade with China is going is going to go exporting well. Exporting to China. Uh, trade, no bilateral trade. India has a deficit with China. Mm, okay. For every um, dollar that it ex, uh, exports to China, it imports three. Uh, three dollars worth of goods. It's manufactured goods. Yes, um, to various products, even yeah. services. I mean, India has um, the largest deficit with China, so it's like thirty percent, I think. So, um, but India-China trade will grow up to hundred billion. That's the target by twenty fifteen. But even now, like if you count, the European Union is India's largest trading partner. Yes, sorry, um, with around. Um, Seven, uh, 74 billion euros, but it would grow, uh, and China and Hong Kong together would be even larger than the European Union. But now it's about um, around 70 billion dollars. Okay, well, for the things moment. are always dynamic, including radio shows, including breaks, you know, because we dynamically have to take breaks. We'll take a short okay. one now. It's, uh, it's Gary Kandakar and me talking about um, where does India fit in the U.S. rebalance strategy. We're going to get to that in the next quarter, so stay right there. You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday on the Think Tech Radio Series here on AM760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. It's actually Jay Fidel sitting in for David Day, but um, I'm a very nice person also. If you want to call us... <laughs> <laughs> and that's Gauri Kandakar. Uh, she is a Pacific Forum Fellow, just about to go back to Brussels. And today we are talking about uh, where does India fit into the U.S. rebalance strategy. But during the break, we got, we got, we got into a segue about life in Europe. And I'd just like to capture that before we move to the, the question in chief about rebalance strategies with the U.S. Life in Europe is pretty good because you can travel everywhere. You can see a different country every weekend. It, the borders are essentially open. People are much more open than they used to be. And you were telling me how you went to Poland to ski. Yeah. It didn't work out very well, though. No, no, that was a, a very, it, but it, it's memorable, you know. It's a memorable incident. But it's true. Life in Europe is very different. And, I, you know, everybody was laughing when Europe got the Nobel Prize recently, Nobel Peace Prize. But everybody seems to forget that it has prevented wars. There are no borders uh, between twin, between uh, six, how many, 17 Schengen countries. And so many countries are using the same currency. They're trying to speak in two languages, which is a lot big deal, you know, for them in Brussels to leave. True. Officially, it's French and English, but then, you know, there are like 20 other complete, uh, the set is 20 languages. But are you, are you saying that European Union is Two, no, no, two, no, 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 no. Or just Brussels? No, in Brussels. In yeah. the European Union working, the yeah. working language is a French and English, which is still uh, quite a bit given their very distinct um, cultures and linguistic and uh, historical setting of each of these countries. They're very proud of it. Uh, but still, you know, they live in so much peace and harmony. And one of the things actually that I've been remarking in the U.S. elections was um, a bit of Europe bashing, which I felt a bit defensive about mm -hmm. Europe in the sense that they're like, oh, no, we don't want to become like social Europe and this, that. But, but they do take care of their people, you know. There's so much solidarity, and I've not seen that much solidarity in India or anywhere else. And they just take care of their people, and you feel safe. You feel that there's somebody to fall back on if you screw up in life or you know if you have a fall but and there's somebody to pick you up and then yes there are bad examples of Greece but then there's also like Sweden and Norway and and Finland and Germany even and all these are social uh, states there's there they have big social programs in place social welfare states um, and they do a lot of uh, for their people and that's working so I think everybody could learn a bit from the Europeans as well and yeah. travel is broadening so when you, you told me during the break that you went skiing in, in Poland, which I didn't know they had skiing in Poland. <laughs> I knew about Switzerland, you know, and, and France nearby, but I didn't know about Poland. And then and you got hurt. Yeah, that's and funny. And you wound up in a hospital in yes, Poland. Yes, yes. And mo most people would be a little concerned winding up in a hospital in Poland, <laughs> you know. But, but they treated you. Uh, it was was part of a social a social network. I mean, a social. Uh, it's beautiful. You know yeah. what? Like, let me tell you how it happened. Okay, first of all, there's 
skiing everywhere, even in Spain and even in in uh, in Germany. I think they even have skiing in Italy and of course Switzerland too. But um, I went skiing in Poland, in the south of Poland, which is called Zakopane, and there's small ski sl slopes, but it's very nice. And I had, a, I actually, this was the second time I was skiing, and like I told you, you know, I was seeing kids just speed by, and I, it was very embarrassing for me, and I said, why not, just let me go for it. And I, <laughs> next thing Famous I, last words. yeah, <laughs> next thing I remember is waking up in a hospital, looking at these emergency rescue people, and I'd hurt my uh, face, which was scratched by the eyes, and then nothing major, but I just uh, had lost my memory for two days. But they took such good care of me. I mean, they were so thorough. X-rays, injections, everything, scans, everything done. And um, the cost of uh, treatment was really not that much, really not. And I was even reimbursed when I went back to France. So they had this kind of European medical um, the European system. European Union yeah. works together on it. it yeah. They work together, all these countries, and you can get reimbursed in any of the EU states. So they have this program, which is brilliant, I think, and this promotes integration so much. I'm sorry you're leaving, because I'd like to do another show about <laughs> this. <laughs> but let's go back to rebalance, yes. okay, now that we've had our segue. Uh, so where does the U.S. fit, uh, where does India fit in the U.S. rebalance strategy? Now we know that the U.S. foreign policy over the past, well, uh, the Obama administration, the uh, first one, uh, was to do a pivot and pay more attention to Asia. And indeed, the president and Hillary Clinton did just that, and successfully so. They paid a lot of attention uh, to Asia, and they made friends there, and personal relations, and all, all that Guan Xi always helps. Yeah. Okay, and now it's called the rebalance strategy. And I guess the question is, how does that affect India? Is India included in, in, in the rebalance strategy? You know, when this um, Asia pivot was announced and uh, it was quickly changed, you asked me why it was changed. And, well, I think because the word pivot itself meant it was a bit kind of not aggressive, but you know, it, it, tra it, it put some people at unease on both sides of the states, the Europeans, because they felt they were p the US was pivoting away from the Europeans. And then uh, the Asians, especially China, and they thought, that what's this whole pivoting towards us? But then they tried to say that it's more of a rebalance of their foreign policy, and they've always been in Asia, and which uh, I agree. I mean, the purpose of my coming here to, was to study this U.S. rebalance strategy. Mm -hmm. um, yes, India is a part of it, especially in the, um, the U.S. State Department and, you know, the official... Uh, circles, uh, of course it is, and the U.S. has been doing uh, quite a bit of work with India, but it's not portrayed as such. I mean, I don't get the feel that when, when they talk about the U.S. pivot, um, or the U.S. rebalance, sorry, to Asia, um, it comes across so much, there's so much, it, com it comes across that there's so much on China, or it about does. China. I mean, people associate the yes. pivot, the rebalance to with China, China and yes. really nobody else, mostly yeah, China. Yeah, exactly. And it's not just me, or it's it's just there, you know. It's just that's how it came about, or that's what people talk about most. And then you have um, uh, Hillary Clinton's visits to Southeast Asia, which have gathered so much, so much um, media coverage as well. Uh, but where does South Asia fit? Let's not just see India. I mean, India should, that's what I'm arguing, that India should be a big part of this rebalance strategy and the U.S. would do, it would do very good for both bilateral relations and the U.S. Uh, foreign policy as such to strengthen its ties with India, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because you don't want it to be seen as a China containment policy, right? So you balance it towards India and then I think including South Asia as such, so Pakistan, Afghanistan and the entire sub-region. Uh, we haven't paid attention to that, have we? Yes, this is not included in the whole um, uh, in the whole picture of the rebalance strategy. Not that much. It's not advertised that much, at least. Um, but I think what's going to be crucial in this rebalance strategy is going to be uh, the role the U.S. plays in Afghanistan. Now I know Afghanistan has been a very huge uh, topic here especially in the debates, and it's, um, and it's vital to your own security concerns and your lives of your soldiers are precious, but um, I think Afghanistan would be 
a, a big determinant of the U.S.'s credibility as an actor in Asia. Mm -hmm. So if you withdraw too soon, and I know India is not happy about U.S. withdrawal in 2014 even, um, that I think would condition how uh, regional actors would see the U.S. Sure. in a way. Well, consistency equals credibility. Yes. You yes. Have, you, have, you can't make zigzag moves. Yeah, it was an Indian that I met yesterday at a conference at HPU, and then he was saying that, yes, um, and he was arguing against this. And I understand, yes, that, you know, there are considerations and policies change. But then he's, what he said was very interesting. He said, yes, you know, one U.S. president says that, well, yes, we will attack Afghanistan, and the next one says, no, we will go out from there. <laughs> it's like, what's going on? And, you know, I, it's normal that things change, but then um, I think that Afghanistan would <laughs> definitely continue to uh, play a big role in the credibility that the U.S. would seem to establish in the region. So it's not only uh, security. I mean, I agree with you certainly that uh, this, is, this has security implications for us and for a lot of countries, but it's also credibility, because yes. in the long term you want to have credibility. Yes. Uh, because that, that ultimately leads to long-term security, actually. <laughs> Even with relations with India, for instance, I mean, if we talk about credibility or just um, what I think India needs or India looks for in uh, international affairs is to have real friends. I mean, that's naive enough, but it does, you know. And then, um, for instance, you have, and it questions, India questions both the European Union and the U.S. as to why they, they, they favor relations with Pakistan for basically for security reasons, but why did they favor relations with Pakistan, even though it was a dictatorship uh, under Musharraf? And it's got a fair amount of terrorism in there right yes, now. Yes, yes. But still, India would have preferred that, you know, the West got stricter or tougher with Pakistan instead, or even with China. And that's for economic reasons there. Uh, China is a huge partner for both European Union and U.S., but then India wonders, um, why is it so, and why not India? Why don't you... Um, would favor us over the others. So it, it somehow looks naively for a true friend, and that creates sometimes a bit of tension between both the uh, relations with the European Union and US. But I think there are pragmatists in Delhi, which which mm -hmm. will definitely see the US as a partner. Well, I, what I hear you saying, and what I want to pursue after this break, is whether the US, and for that matter, the European Union, take India for granted. And maybe they do. We'll find out more about this with uh, Gary Kandakar right after this break. Stay there. You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday on the Think Tech radio series here on AM760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. I'm getting to feel more and more like him. <laughs> I'm going to have an identity crisis. But today it's not David Day, it's Jay Fidel. And we're doing uh, Asia in Review, and we're talking about uh, where does India fit in the U.S. rebalance strategy, uh, previously known as the pivot, with Gary Kandakar, who is Indian and uh, who is also just finishing up a, a fellowship at Pacific Forum and returning this very evening to Brussels uh, to resume her work um, doing, what, research on the relations of the European Union with Asia and especially and India. India, which is really admirable. It makes me it makes me rethink my whole career. God <laughs> <laughs> Do you know ASEC, A I S E C? Yeah. Association of yeah. International Students of yes, yes. Economics and Commerce, you know? I had a few friends uh, doing that, yeah. Is that right? I had a I had a job uh, when I was in college uh, which was gonna take me to Helsinki and oh. I was gonna work for a bank in Helsinki and be a member of ASEC, but I, I decided I'd better go to summer camp instead. Yeah, and I do. regret that ever since. <laughs> oh, no, don't regret it. There's 30 feet of snow there, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, I wanted to pursue the uh, the whole discussion about the rebalance strategy a little more. <clears throat> and, you know, there is, there is the implication that the U.S. pays more attention to China than other countries, which should also be in the rebalance strategy. And it makes you wonder, you know, what... I mean, if, if it's just repivot or pivoting, then it's, okay, we're going to put more attention on one area or one country, and, and, and it's very simple that way. But if it's a rebalancing, then there's multiple priorities. Well and you said. have to consider all the players, mm. and uh, I'm not sure you need a rebalancing as much as a, re a review of the whole foreign policy, you know, about all these countries. That's really what it is. Mm. The world changes. We have to change our foreign policy. Complicated. 
But uh, if, if the U.S. were to do the right thing, whatever that is, what would it be doing with India? What would, what would you recommend to either this or the next Secretary of State? You see, I've spoken a lot about um, problematics in relations both with uh, European Union and uh, U.S. vis-a-vis -vis Asia, especially the U.S., and I thought they could be doing more. And um, there's a lot. I mean, they do do a lot. They do, a, they do quite a bit, you know, like military exercises. They do the most with India. They've been selling. Um, India is the largest import, arms importer in the world, by the way, and they buy a lot from the U.S. Um, but just consistency in relations is one other thing like for instance there was one thing that was criticized in India when President Obama went there um, was he had a brilliant uh, he had a brilliant visit but then he spoke about um, Pakistan but in a more uh, not a more critical way but you know and he spoke about Kashmir which is a very sensitive topic yes, in India yes. and that was seen as a faux pas but just small issues like this but let me ta tell you about India too so I'm not only saying you know there's faults here and there I think it's both partners for one India's foreign policy is still pretty embryonic and it's um, prudent and it's very constricted so it's still developing India does not see itself um, uh, as a superpower I mean there was um, uh, the 2010, I think, foreign policy review, and then, the, sorry, India's uh, 2010 National Secu Security Annual Review, um, and India just said we're at a loss at how to exercise this newly acquired potential as a, a global power or a global actor. Uh, India's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for one, is very tiny. It's 700 people, 700. That's even tinier than Sweden's. Mm. So it's very small like that. Um, corruption is huge in India and then our um, uh, government has been battling corruption or it's also involved in corruption issues but scandals um, but there's a whole movement led by Anna Hazari and now it's broken up into different factions but still they've been pressuring the government uh, to do a lot more um, there's also um, a various um, issues related to poverty, for instance. I mean, you know, everybody makes this mistake about just seeing rising India and emerging India, but they don't seem to see the development uh, challenges that India has. I mean, there are 400 million people in India living without electricity. Well, still? Still. You mean, for the, the power failure, it must be three, four months ago, <laughs> right? 400 million people without access to electricity. You mean, you mean because in total. of the power failure? No, no, they no, never no, had no. It they never the had it. Place. They never had it in the first place. I think with the power failure, it must have jumped up. But uh. yeah, yeah. So that's, that's uh, you know, what? One, one third of the population? Or yes, one, one third of the population. More than the entire U.S. population. Doesn't have power. Yes. And then. Um, we could it, sell them some power. I'm only kidding. Yeah, no, we, we India's, get, you know, U.S. <laughs> is doing that. I mean, the whole <laughs> nuclear deal yeah, yeah. struck in the Bush era. Uh, was based on this um, uh, this thinking that you know it would help India become self-reliant or actually uh, meet its energy uh, energy needs. So um, selling uranium to India, but India has around uh, twenty nuclear power power plants. Right now, today. Yes, I think yeah, nineteen power plants, and then uh, it aims to have twenty-five percent of its elect uh, energy mix coming from nuclear energy by twenty fifty. So there's a long way to go, but I think one of the problems is that um, the U.S. needs a security agreement so that um, this the energy, the you name it, will sell to India will be used uh, for peaceful purposes. Um, so I think sales of uranium are waiting uh, because of that. But oh. but in the meantime, was that part of the Bush nuclear initiative back? Must be oh, five or six the years NSG ago. The NSG waiver it was in two thousand and nine that it got through. Okay, so, th so that has not been implemented yet. He was talking about selling uranium to India, but it hasn't actually happened. No, he, the deal was that India would be, um, India would get a waiver from this nuclear suppliers group that it they could sell uranium to India. Now, that the U.S. was key to get. To India, the India they also cite this one, two, three nuclear deal. But in the meantime, I mean, Russia, 
for instance, says that we don't require this um, safeguard agreement, uh, that India would use it only for peaceful, peaceful energy purposes. So Russia has been taking advantage of all of this. So I just think, um, <laughs> yeah, so you see, the like, yeah. U.S. did all the hard work, and then yeah. there's Russia kind yeah. of getting there yeah. and Kill taking joy. all the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on the whole, I think with India, it's just um, understanding how India works in foreign policy. And I don't think India has shifted very far away from um, its non-alignment policy tell, still. Tell us about the non-alignment policy. You mentioned that before. And I think that it, it sounds like that's the basic cultural point, non-alignment. And you have to really work to get away from that. But what is it? Well, you know the history of the non-aligned movement, right? Well, it was in the, um, in the Cold War period, India refused to choose any camps, um, not Russia, not US, and it said, you know, we have big priorities, the development priorities, and then uh, we would like to peacefully continue our own, um, our own path without having to choose any of the others. Um, I think that was prudent. India escaped all these wars that tore the entire world, and then the economic uh, upheavals that it had. Of course, India was closed economy. It was based so much on the Soviet model. It also had these five-year plans and the socialist system. But it started opening up slowly, slowly on its own. Uh, economic reforms came through in 1991. But in all through that, uh, and even in international relations, India seeks a more um, balanced, uh, multipolar, a global system where without, without hard alliances without that, alliances that make enemies of the other yes. guy it believes in having friendly relations with everyone and everyone meaning even north korea if it has to or myanmar for instance yeah. um it's just um, india sees its own uh, development priorities it's very inward looking you know very inward looking because it has huge development priorities and then its foreign policy expands to its sub-region, so South Asia. So Pakistan is a priority, um, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan. I think these, the lat latter three countries get around um, the largest chunk of uh, India's aid, for instance. Let me just give you one of the figures, was that there's just one person in the Indian ministry who looks at aid, political and diplomatic relations for all these three countries. Um, well, that's an enviable <coughs> job, I suppose. But, yeah, but Could I mean, spend a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, India is doing a, a quite a bit, but then it remains wary of getting into alliances. So, in coming back to this U.S. pivot as well, India does not want to be seen as being used. Uh, being used. Being used against China, manipulated, or but doesn't that order. happen? That happens in diplomatic relations. It happens in foreign policy. It's always a chess game, and you become a bargaining chip without even realizing it. So India doesn't want to do that. It doesn't want to become an object. No, very prudent. I mean, Delhi is very prudent. It does not want to do that. It's always, um, it sees where its gains are, and why not? You know, it's in international relations. There are no friends. There are only interests, as somebody said about countries. So uh, India is seeking its own interests. Um, and so I think it's going to, uh, even in the, um, in various issues like climate change, for instance, it aligns with the BRICS group, the BRICS grouping, but it does not have much similarities with either of them. And even any countries in the BRICS group, they don't have that many overwhelming similarities. So I think India is just going to pick and choose case by case rather than having one alliance uh, think, with anyone. You know, it, it actually not only sounds prudent, it sounds unique. <laughs> <laughs> India is unique. India is unique. We're going to find out more why India is unique with Gary Kandakar, a Pacific Forum fellow, right after this break. Stay there. You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday <laughs> on the Think Tech radio series here on AM 760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. Okay, I give up. I am David Day. <laughs> I've, I, I've transmuted myself into David Day. I may sound like Jay Fidel, but here I am on Asia in Review and Think Tech with Gary Kandakar, a Pacific Forum fellow, about to return to Brussels this very evening after her fellowship at Pacific Forum. And before we took the break, we talked about the things that make India unique. Unique in foreign policy, 
uh, unique in the world, uh, and it is a remarkable country. It's kind of stayed out of trouble. A democracy with how many millions, billions of people, and it stayed out of trouble all this time. What do you attribute that to? I mean, there are so many factors, but yes, this, like I mentioned, you know, is this, um, there's a certain quality of humanity in our culture that's come down to us um, from, from the Indus Valley civilization, basically, from our scriptures, say, what we're taught in Gandhi, for instance. I mean, our freedom struggle had a huge impact um, uh, on, on the shaping of India, on every Indian, I think, and that's still valid. If you grow up in India, that's how you think. And um, like I was saying, we are a democracy. We're the largest democracy in the world. And it's not easy to be a democracy. I mean, you could mm. have a very easy going, um, fast political model like China's, which, which just uh, very conveniently shifts out everything out of its way, whatever is not needed. But India moves with all its people, all the poverty, all its challenges, all the corruption, and it tries to rise up ahead and uh, provide uh, basic services to millions of people and um, and raise people out of poverty. So that's that's um, yeah. That's well, I think we have to watch India, you know, to see how well it does in the years to come. I mean, it is unique. You know what uh, the Tocqueville said about democracies that they're tumultuous, and I don't think India is any exception to that rule. It's tumultuous. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the one, I told you at, at the break that there's one thing about India that strikes me as unique that, uh, that I was going to surprise you with. Yes. And, and here's my perception, and it comes from watching Indian movies, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Indian people, the Indian culture has a terrific sense of humor. And you have to like anybody who has a good sense of humor, isn't it true? <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned it. I mean, you know, it's true. We have we have hilarious movies, and we love to watch all these um, crazy Bollywood movies, or these very lovey-dovey kind of, you know, yeah. everything is beautiful and yeah. romantic movies. It's just because, you know, people in India, and my mom says this all the time too, she's like, yeah, we just go into a movie, uh, even if you don't have money, you know, people buy a ticket, they go into movies, they forget their attention, then they come out singing the songs, you know. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> and yeah, you're right. Yeah. We've just, it's escapism or whatever. But yes, it's true. And thank you for, for mentioning well, sure. that. Well, I, I think that's special. But, but here now, the, the reality going forward is that you have to somehow, India has to somehow fit in the U.S. rebalance strategy uh, without giving up its, uh, you know, essential... Uh, independence, non-alignment, if I can use that term. Um, and at the same time, it has to compete for maybe U.S. attention or for world attention and uh, economic attention with China. And China moves fast. It has a different system. It doesn't have that yeah. kind of democracy you're talking about. Uh, how, is, how is this going to unfold? Because that competition has been getting, uh, I think, more pronounced. Is that, I'd tell me if you agree. Uh, in, the, in the past 10 or 15 years, and India has got to has got to deal with it somehow. Yes, um, and just to go back to this U.S. Uh, rebalance and where India fits, I think there's a lot of potential. And U.S. and India are somehow natural partners, democracies, same beliefs and and values and uh, value systems and uh, complementary economies. So I think there's uh, a lot of potential there and I think India is a strategic partner for the U.S. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, that given, yes, there have been um, tensions with China which have always existed uh, since the 1962 war uh, India had with China and that was um, a shameful defeat for us but it was, you know, we were yeah. not prepared for that. They invaded. They, they invaded they us. The border yeah, at the night north. and yeah. um, we were not prepared. We didn't expect it. Um, and that was a big shame. But um, anyway, since we've prepared, uh, and since then, uh, we have we still we have we're, we're we're very wary about China. We're aware that it, they're there. They're big. Um, we're also big, but um, we're cautious. We're cautious. We can't trust China that much. Um, you know, we have border disputes, and China claims uh, one of our states. Actually, India is a federal. Uh, Republic, so we have these states, and it claims Arunachal Pradesh, for instance. Uh, up in the north. 
Uh, up in the northeast. Um, and that, for instance, is a big, big sticking point in Indochina relations. For now, just recently, China issued its new passport with its map, and the map of China. And that map Includes. has been upsetting all the countries that have borders with China because, you know, it includes everybody's disputed territories. <laughs> so that's been a big mm -hmm. issue. Uh, and India does the same, actually, when it issues visas to Chinese nationals. It prints the map of India on these visas. So <laughs> <laughs> but that said, you know, um, I always say this to Europeans and Americans whenever I meet them. I say, yes, you know, uh, your case is very special that you have the most acrimonious, uh, amazing relations with your neighbors. But in, in Asia, every country has horrible relations with every neighbor. They hate each other, but they get along, you know, they've coexisted. For example, uh, in the South China Sea, there have been uh, navy, uh, there have been troops and navy stationed there for decades. But there have not been even one combat-related uh, com um, combat uh, casualty amongst any of these mm -hmm. partners. Uh, Japan, China were at loggerheads now in the East China Sea, but no conflict. Um, you know, the reason behind this is economics, economic integration. Um, Uninstitutionalized uh, economic integration, so intra-regional trade, has been growing rapidly, rapidly between all these countries, it stands at around 53% compared to the European Union's institutionalized integration at 65%. So intra-regional trade is enormous. India-China trade too. I mean, yes, we have these um, skirmishes day by day, I think, and then we have uh, diplomatic tensions. Uh, we don't see eye to eye on various issues, but uh, we're still uh, going ahead with the uh, trade. Uh, we want. We have a target of hundred billion dollars by 2015. Like I said, uh, mm -hmm. Hong Kong and China together would make up India's largest trading partner. Um, we align with China on the BRICS format and various other formats. Uh, just like China, we shared positions on the Arab Springs, for instance, and um, to a lesser degree, but uh, yes, Arab Springs and. We're talking about uh, entering the SCO, the Shanghai Corporation Organization, and uh, various other issues, you know, various other initiatives. And then uh, we, we do admire China's rise. We do admire, in India, we have this admiration for how China was able to raise so many people up, up from poverty, how China was able to rise so much, and it is an Asian partner. But um, yes, we also kind of then feel um, uh, we console ourselves that yes, but that's because you know their political system and we're a democracy. We'll get there sometime. But um, this well, is love-hate relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's what it sounds like. And I, and I wonder if you, you know, you're you're in Brussels, you're in the European Union in every way. You, you, you work there, you research there, you travel there, you have friends around the uh, European Union, so you know how those countries have come together yes. and melted their borders. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I've always uh, wondered about, for example, Southeast Asia, whether the borders would someday melt in Southeast Asia. And every time I ask anybody that question, they say, never, it'll never happen. <laughs> why can't, why can't <laughs> Asia be more like the European Union? No. Uh, I guess we're going to have to leave that question hanging. <laughs> yeah, but just in a nutshell, yeah, I'm telling you, you guys are special. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are special for sure. Why does India, where does India fit in the U.S. rebound strategy? With Gauri Kandakar. Thank you so much, Gauri. It's been great to have you on the show. Thanks so much. It's a wonderful farewell gift, and it's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Aloha.